Welcome to episode 98 of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. I'm a retired agent writing crime fiction inspired by true crime FBI cases. Today, we get to speak to retired agent Eric Alpert, who served in the FBI for 25 years. During his bureau career, he was involved in the investigations and received specialized training in kidnapping, child abduction, criminal profiling, crisis management, violent crime, and homicide investigations. In this episode, Eric Alpert reviews the high-profile investigation of multi-millionaire Thomas Capano for the disappearance and murder of Anne-Marie Fahey. Anne-Marie Fahey had been the scheduling secretary for the governor of Delaware, and Capano was a powerful attorney with many high-level contacts and connections in the Wilmington area. Later in his career, Alpert was promoted to supervisory positions in the violent crime section of the Criminal Investigative Division at FBI headquarters and the Behavioral Analysis Unit in Quantico. He retired as the Senior Supervisory Resident Agent in the Tampa Division's Orlando Resident Agency. Now, before we get to that interview, please just give me a few minutes first to say Happy New Year because this is the first official episode of FBI Retired Case File Review for 2018. This year, my second novel, Greedy Givers, will be out later this spring. And my daughter, yes, the one that got married in June of 2017, is now having a baby in June of 2018. So I'm going to be a grandmother for the first time, even though I am way too young for that. So for me, 2018 is going to be full of magical miracles. And I hope that the year also has lots of great things in store for you. I am looking for retired agents who have great case presentations, who want to come on the show. If you're listening and that's you, please email me. Or if you know a retired agent or a case that you would like for me to see if I can get someone on to talk about, just email me at jerrywilliamsauthor at gmail.com. I want to remind you to join my reader team where once a month I send out a digest of the show notes for the episodes from the month before as well as my crime fiction recommendations. And I'll keep you up to date on the FBI in books, TV, and movies. When you join my reader team, I'll send you the reading resource, which is a list of books about the FBI, fiction, true crime, and memoirs written exclusively by the agents who have appeared on this podcast. If you're interested in joining, all you need to do is go to my website, jerrywilliams.com and sign up when you see the pop-up or go to my Facebook page, Jerry Williams Author, and there's a sign up button there. One last thing, I do have a crime fiction recommendation for you this week. It's the new John Grisham book, and I hope you stick around after the interview and check that out. And now... Here's the show. I'm excited to introduce my guest, Eric Alpert. Hey, Eric, how are you? I am fine. How are you? I'm good. I am good. Now, I know about this case because, of course, you know, it it occurred in Delaware and in New Jersey and Pennsylvania, that whole tri-state area. We all heard about this case. And so I knew that I wanted to talk to you so that you could share it on FBI Retired Case File Review. It's the case of Thomas Capano and Amory Fahey. And if people who don't live in this region aren't aware of this investigation, this missing person murder investigation, uh, I think they're going to really be fascinated by the case, not only because of what happened, but the people who are involved uh, are the, the, the person that's involved. So why don't you give us a little tease about the case before you go into detail? 
Well, this was an FBI investigation uh, back in 1996 uh, involving the uh, kidnap, murder, disappearance of Anne Marie Fahey. At the time of her disappearance, she was the scheduling secretary for then governor of the state of Delaware, Thomas Carper, who is now a uh, United States senator. The uh, subject of the case is Thomas Capano, who is a multimillionaire and very politically connected uh, individual. When she goes missing, everybody is really surprised because somebody of with her connections. I would imagine that, you know, normally, of course, law enforcement is going to, to be interested in looking for somebody who's missing. But right. somebody who works for the governor, when that person goes missing... I think all law enforcement is put on notice and, and really wants to do a good job in seeking all the information. Correct. So tell me, when did you first learn about this case and, and become involved? Uh, I became involved in, uh, in 1996. Uh, Anne-Marie Fahey, who was the uh, victim of the case, she was, as we said, the governor's scheduling secretary time of her disappearance, she was 29 years old. She's a white female, unmarried. Uh, she was described by everyone as very attractive, intelligent, hardworking, and someone who was very organized, both in her uh, professional life and her personal life. In fact, uh, her nickname among her friends was uh, Anal Annie, and that she had to have everything had to be in its place. She was uh, the youngest of six children. She was a lifelong Wilmington uh, native and uh, at the time of her disappearance she was residing in the city of Wilmington. She had an apartment on the second floor of a house that had converted into apartments with the landlady who lived downstairs. The subject as we talked about was Thomas Capano at the time of uh, Emery Faye's disappearance. Tom uh, was a white male, 47 years old. He was married, he had four kids, very politically connected individual, a multimillionaire as we noted. The Capano name is well known in Delaware. His father, Louis Capano Sr., started up a uh, big developing firm building houses and shopping centers and made his fortune doing that. Upon his death, two of Tom's younger brothers took it over and took it to even a higher level there. Tom went to college outside the state. He went to uh, Boston College undergrad and the Boston College of Law. Upon graduating law school, he moved back to Wilmington, got married, started to practice law. His first job was as a prosecutor for the uh, State Attorney General's office. He eventually became a city solicitor for the city of Wilmington. And at one point, he was the uh, legal counsel for the governor of the state of Delaware, who was at that time Mike Castle. In between, he went into private practice with law firms. And at the uh, time of Anne Marie Faye's death, he was uh, a partner in a major Philadelphia law firm. He was in their Wilmington office. And he was involved in uh, public financing in that he would help the, the city of Wilmington and the state of Delaware get bonds to finance various projects. Now, he and Anne Marie's phase passed the uh, cross back in 1993. They met at a fundraiser. He would see her often at the governor's office. She was a scheduling secretary, so she controlled the door of who, would, who was going to see the governor, and Tom Trapano being involved in bond issues was often there. They began a romantic relationship which uh, continued on uh, because she was unmarried and he was married. They would often meet up in Pennsylvania and Philadelphia area, and at times they'd go off on vacations together. And it was a, a, a secret, it was an affair that nobody wanted to uh, disclose. Uh, in addition to Tom Capano having an affair with Anne-Marie Faye, he was also having a long-term affair with a woman by the name of Deborah McIntyre. She was the... Uh, wife of a lawyer who worked in Tom's Capano's law firm. She eventually divorced her husband and bought a house within walking distance of Tom Capano's house with his with his four children. She uh, expected Tom, once his kids got older, to divorce his wife and move in with her and that they would have a life together. In addition to those two relationships to Tom Capano, we found throughout the course of the investigation was uh, having uh, sexual relations with numerous women he had a very derogatory term for these one-night stands, but we realized that he was having just not just these two relationships. He was running around with various other women in the state of Delaware, and many of them turned out to be uh, also politically connected. And that's how the relationship was going to 94. It was still like that. 
1995, Anne Marie Fay decided she was looking to get out of the relationship. She started dating uh, men her own age who was also unmarried, who was successful, and started to try to break it off with Tom Capano. Well, he wouldn't hear anything of that. In fact, he moved out of his house where he lived with his family, rented a large home on uh, on what we called Grant Avenue. It became known to us as the Grant Avenue House. And it was a large house in a very exclusive area, three doors down from him, a U.S. congressman resided. And uh, she continued to try to break it off with him. And that's how things were going as we got into uh, 1996. How many people knew about their affair? Thank you. How many people knew about the affair? Her friends knew about it, and that's it. Her family didn't know about it. Uh, Deborah McIntyre didn't know about it. Uh, Did his wife? Pretty much just her family. His wife, uh, I'm sure she knew he was running around. She didn't know specifically of Anne Marie Fahey, though, or Deborah McIntyre. She just knew that Tom was uh, constantly running around with other women. And so and, this affair was continuing in, in 1994, 1995? And into 96, uh, she was trying to break it off, but we, as during the investigation, found that he uh, wouldn't let it go. Uh, he was stalking her, threatened to expose the affair to others. He, to him, I guess it didn't matter if people knew about it, but to her, it was very important. It didn't. It would bring shame to her, her family and to the uh, to the governor's office. So she did not want it to be. Uh, be put out there, and he kept threatening with that, saying that if uh, you don't stay with me, I'm going uh, to uh, go ahead and expose all of this to everybody. And that's how it was going into the uh, day she was last seen, which was June 27th of uh, 1996. Uh, it was a Thursday. She worked at the governor's office there in Wilmington. Uh, at the end of the day, she left, said goodbye to everybody, and nobody ever saw her again. The next day, uh, Friday, she had already scheduled to take off, so nobody missed her. Saturday, people began to get concerned. Her boyfriend was trying to get in touch with her. They were supposed to have dinner at her at Anne Marie Fahey's sister's home that evening with her uh, family and kids. And she was going to bring her boyfriend to dinner there. He couldn't get a hold of her. He kept leaving, leaving messages for her. Her sister started calling, leaving messages. When they couldn't find her at 10 that night, they uh, her sister called some of Anne Marie's girlfriends. and They didn't know where she was, and they all went over to Anne Marie's apartment. She wasn't home. The landlord had a key. The landlord let him in. They went upstairs to her uh, small apartment, and uh, what they saw there uh, concerned them. There was some food left out on the counter. There was a dress that was uh, laying across a chair. Even though it was neatly laid across the chair, it wasn't the way she would leave it. And a couple of her shoes were out of place in the closet. And most people, that would be a normal, you know, normal. But to them, knowing how she was with her nickname, Anal Annie, she would never have left the house like that. They uh, reached out to the governor, and the governor immediately dispatched the state police, who were his protective detail, to her to her apartment at 10 that night, Saturday. State police, because it's in the city of Wilmington, police department jurisdiction, went ahead and called the city police, so they showed up there. And Robert Donovan, who was a detective on call, he gets called. And when he gets there, he gets up to the apartment and he sees uh, a room full of people there, uh, Anne Marie's uh, friends, her uh, family, police officers in uniform, state police, and they're all going through all of her her things there. So if there's a crime scene, it's been totally obliterated by now because they're trying to figure out where she is. And her sister has gotten a hold of her diary and is reading Anne Marie's diary and seeing that she had been having a uh, a relationship with Tom Capano. They also are finding letters from Tom Capano in the apartment talking about their relationship. And they're showing that to the, the police and the detectives. And pretty much the last uh, entry in the diary that Anne Marie wrote was that uh, she had finally brought closure to Thomas Capano. What a controlling, manipulative, insecure, jealous maniac. So with wow. that, a uh, uh, Detective Donovan and a detective from the state police at 3 in the morning went out to Tom Capano's Grand Avenue house to uh, see if she was there and to uh, try to interview him. And uh, he both answered the door in his bathrobe, said nobody else was at the house, that she wasn't there. He hemmed and hawed a little about his relationship with her, but then he said that on Thursday, June 27th, they were having they had dinner together. He picked her up at her apartment, drove her to, uh, they went up to Philadelphia for dinner. They had dinner there. 
drove back to his place at Grant Avenue, picked up a few items from his house that she needed, food stuff, so that type of thing. Then he drove her back to her apartment, went up to her apartment with her, uh, brought the items up there. She had asked him to check his air conditioner, her air conditioner. He said he did that. Then he left, hadn't seen her since then. And uh, that's what he told the police. He said he said something about her being flighty and erratic and unstable and that she's probably somewhere with her friends at the beach and she would turn up on Monday. And they left it at that. And they went back. They said, if we don't, if she doesn't turn up uh, by tomorrow, uh, we're going to come back. We're going to have a formal interview with, with you. And uh, she didn't turn up, of course, the next day on Sunday. So they went back to try to interview him. He wasn't home. They found him at his wife's house uh, with the kids. And uh, he refused to talk to him. He said he talked to an attorney. And the attorney said he'd already said too much already and he wasn't going to talk anymore. On Monday, July 1st, she didn't show up for work. And the first publicity for the case started. There was a, in the local paper, there was just a picture of her on the front page saying that she was missing with a phone number to call if anybody had seen her. On uh, Tuesday, July 2nd, there was more in-depth story, and the TV media was now picking it up, saying that she was the governor's scheduling secretary is missing. She was last seen in Philadelphia. There was no mention of Tom Capano at that point. And that's when uh, we start getting involved. Uh, I was in the Wilmington Resident Agency, which is uh, a satellite office out of the Baltimore division. We had uh, a supervisor who was Tim Munson and, complement of 10 agents, but we never usually had 10 agents. There are people going, coming and going and retirements. Uh, I had about 14 years in the FBI at that point. Uh, six of those in the uh, Wilmington Dell Re- resident agency. And most of the cases I had been working there were, uh, I had been the case agent on long-term complex uh, investigations, as you find on numerous Title Threes and we used undercovers and cooperating witnesses extensively, but due to the lack of manpower there, these cases were all worked in a task force uh, setting with uh, mostly city police uh, being deputized and working the cases uh, with me there, but the FBI is the lead investigating it uh, and taking the cases federally. Well, what did you uh, usually work? Well, the first uh, case was involved uh, uh, the Cosa Nostra mafia case, which we worked uh, jointly with... Uh, we had a Delaware section of it, and we joined, worked it with a strike force uh, out, of, out of Philadelphia. I had uh, several wiretaps there and a cooperating witness who was uh, deeply embedded in the group. Uh, then a couple of uh, drug cases against uh, local drug uh, drug dealers. Uh, we worked those together. We were able to put one of them away for over 27 years and seize a bunch of uh, assets and forfeitures, which... We always gave the lion's share to the to the city or to the to the state of all the forfeitures there, which kept them interested in continuing to keep the task force going. And we just kept going from case to case. When one was getting close to being finished, we talked about what we were going to do next, and we'd go with the same group to work the uh, next case. So you worked a variety of things. Was uh, was kidnapping, missing persons, something that you had worked before? Hadn't really gotten into any of those type of cases there, not federal kidnappings, uh, where I'd be the lead on it. I covered, would cover leads when I was in other divisions on it, but nothing nothing where I was there uh, in Delaware. And then, uh, so I, d- I did that till 95. In 1995, we had a, a Safe Street Violent Crime Task Force, uh, which is headed by the FBI, just like my task forces were, but it was all staffed by state and local law enforcement, and we were targeting the most violent uh, individuals in the state of Delaware. There was also a weed and seed task force, which again required the FBI to be the lead on it. I was asked if I would be willing to take those over. Uh, it was mainly because I had a very close relationship with the city police and uh, with the state police, having worked all these cases with them and developed a good relationship of uh, of uh, trust with them. So I ended up taking those over and worked a lot in the city PD. I was over there virtually every day and work go to the FBI office and go to the city police and we'd be working our cases off of there. I had a, a desk that I sort of just took over there and somebody slapped a sign on it saying FBI West because the desk I always used and it was four blocks west of where the FBI uh, resident agency was. July 2nd, I was over at the PD and I was hearing the, the buzz about this case. It hadn't 
reached epic proportions yet, but they are now becoming more and more concerned because now it's a couple of days in and they really don't have much to go on and talk of panels refusing to talk. And uh, when they told me they were last seen in Philadelphia, I said, well, I could open up an FBI kidnapping case. I was working on crime matters. I could probably open up a case on it. Didn't want to think that we were trying to steal a case from them. Uh, I reached out to Bob Donovan, who was the lead investigator for the city, and I said, uh, you know, Bobby, do you need some help on this? And he said, sure, I'd love any help you can give me. So uh, and I, I called. I'd like to, I'd like to just uh, interject here just for a second so people understand why the FBI could be involved in this case at this point because of the fact of them being in Philadelphia. Could you explain that? Well, for FBI uh, kidnapping case, uh, you have to have some interstate aspect. So we could say that he took her from Wilmington, Delaware, into Pennsylvania to Philadelphia, and the last place she was seen alive was in uh, was in Philadelphia. So you could say that you had the interstate aspect of it for kidnapping. It doesn't have to be always violent. You could uh, trick somebody into going or extort them into going, as long as they went against their will. So I felt there was enough that I could at least uh, start looking at it as a kidnapping case, and that's why. I reached out to Bobby Donovan, who said, come on in. I could use whatever help I can get. I called uh, the U.S. Attorney's Office, spoke to the U.S. Attorney, who was Greg Sleet at the time, and told him what I'd like to do, and he was all for it. He uh, then handed me off to uh, one of his AUSAs, Colm Conley, who was, uh, I knew him as a young, very intelligent, and very aggressive prosecutor, told him you know, we wanted to get in. Uh, we talked about getting court orders for phone records, uh, Tom Capano's phone and Marie Faye's phone, his cell phones, and to put up a pen register on his uh, home phone there. And I think we had those court orders uh, done by the end of the day and had our tech people working on it right away. And Eric, could you explain what a pen register is? Pen register was, would be set up on a phone and it would register what calls are coming in. That you can't hear what's going on, but it'll tell you who's calling and it'll show you what number they're coming from and what numbers are going out. And what was the purpose of putting a pen register on Tom Capano's phone at that time? Well, at that time we didn't know if he had, uh, if there'd been, uh, if she was murdered or whether he was holding her somewhere. We were thinking that because there'd been a case against one of his brothers who had been having a relationship, sexual relationship with uh, a babysitter who was, was over 18, but when she tried to break it off, he grabbed her up and took her to an apartment and kept her there for several days against her will. So some of that was, from that case, was bleeding over into this thing. Well, maybe he's doing what his brother had done. Uh, the brother is, of course, never convicted of that. Uh, the woman uh, left the state and uh, refused to return the uh, to testify against him. He took some misdemeanor uh, type of plea there. We don't know why, but we assume that somebody might have given us some money to not come back. Well, that's why we put the pen register on it and also to see who he was talking to, uh, possibly with regard if he had, if he had uh, uh, murdered her and put her and dumped the body somewhere, maybe we could find out who he was talking to. We also did a toll back, which can go for the phone company, can pull all the calls that have come into that house over the last two weeks before all this happened so we could see who he was calling before we even got the pen register up around when he when she went missing in the first couple of days afterwards so it was like we could get the phone records at least with regard who he was calling and who had called him prior to putting on the pen register and one other thing i want to do is just set the the stage a little bit because you talked about Wilmington being a resident agency out of the Baltimore office. But the Baltimore office is about an hour and a half away from Wilmington when the Philadelphia division is only about 30 to 40 minutes away. That's correct. The uh, Wilmington is, a, is, is much closer to Philadelphia. It's in the Philadelphia media market, but it's uh, always uh, been out of the uh, Baltimore division. And uh, so that's where we were on July 2nd. Uh, we were I was starting to get in and talking to Bobby Donovan about where they were going with this on uh, July 3rd, that uh, Wednesday. The uh, media broke big on it. They uh, named Tom Capano as the last person to be seen with her. And, uh, so now it was really heating up on July 4th. Uh, they had a, the city coordinated a big search of the uh, park near where uh, Emory's apartment was. And uh, they had the public there. The public was... Uh, being led by the police on how to do a grid search there. They didn't find anything. 
And then it became more of an international case because on July 8th, President Clinton made his remarks. He said he was very concerned and that the scheduling secretary uh, for Governor Carper, his good friend, was missing, and he offered all federal resources. And that came back later when I was testifying in court when the defense was saying the only reason the FBI got involved in this is because President Clinton told them to. And I could say we were already in. We got in on July 2nd, well, before he made his remarks there. So uh, the investigation is now going on. Still not finding her. Uh, next two weeks, we're going out and doing interviews of mostly her friends and others, trying to track down any videos that may be out there from businesses as such. And uh, there are problems occurring in the uh, in what's going on there. And some of it comes back from uh, the attorney that Tom Capano hired. Tom Capano immediately went out and hired Charles Oberly. Charles Oberly is well known in the state. He'd been an attorney, the state attorney general for 12 years. He ran for the U.S. Senate and lost. And after losing uh, the election, he started his own law firm and he brought several of his prosecutors with him. One of the issues that was going on was any time any investigative work would be done and it's handed over to the state attorney general's office because they're going to be the lead prosecutors because the city and the state were the lead on the case. It seemed to be going right after the media and to the defense team. And it's impossible to work a case where everything you do is immediately being disclosed to everybody. And the other issues that were uh, coming up was the uh, the media was turning now hard on the uh, city police saying that uh, they were incompetent, that they couldn't find her. This has been two, three weeks. They couldn't find her. They didn't know what they, didn't know what they were doing. Came, got to the point where they did a big caricature in the, in the paper there of a city police officer in full uniform walking uh, on the beach with a, a, a caption on the niece was, how can they find Emory Faye when they can't even find sand at the beach? I, I don't recall that, that negativity. What was fueling that? Because a lot of times you have a missing person and it takes a while to discover what happened to them. Sometimes law enforcement never finds out what happens. For whatever reason, they turned, they were turning on them quickly. I don't know if it was coming from the uh, Capanos with their political connections uh, or just the media just turning on the police there because they wanted a quick resolution to this. They figured somebody who is this high profile as scheduling secretary for the governor shouldn't be missing for two, three weeks without any, any sign of her and no uh, progress in the investigation, mainly because everything was getting leaked out so they could see there was really nothing going forward with it. And uh, I was in, in meetings with uh, various higher-ups from the from the state, and they started, uh, I mentioned to them that if the federal government took the lead on it, we would make it a federal grand jury investigation and use the grand jury secrecy uh, provisions there to cut off uh, a lot of the leaks here. And uh, at this point, the city chief of police of the city was all for that, and the state police were all for it. Even the state attorney general's office was uh, was all for that. I talked to the uh, U.S. attorney's office, and they, they, at that point, didn't have a problem with uh, going federal, that they would take the lead as the prosecution, and we would take the lead as the investigative agency. I spoke to you know, my supervisor, and then we talked to the uh, SAC of Baltimore at that time was Tim McNally. He was the uh, first of two SACs on the case, and, and he was a you know, great job on everything. And Dave Nolan was the second one who was there when we concluded it, and he, he was all a big supporter of the case and did a great job on it, too. Uh, Tim McNally didn't have a problem with us taking the lead. Uh, his problem was he didn't want us to be stealing a case from the state and whatever, even though we told him that they wanted to get out of it. He wanted to hear it from, from their mouths. So uh, July 18th, we had the big meeting at the U.S. Attorney's Office in the big conference room with the big table. And I was there, uh, Tim Munson, my supervisor, and uh, SAC Tim McNally and the U.S. Attorney and his first assistant, Colin Connolly, the chief of police, had brought in his whole entourage of uh, higher-ups. State police, same thing. And the, the, the attorney general for the state was there, and she had an entourage with her. And they all went around the room giving the reasons why they thought the federal government should take the lead and the FBI should take the lead. Uh, they talked about the leaks. They also talked a lot about Tom Capano being politically connected and that this case could bleed over into every politician into this in the state because he was connected to many of them and to a lot of the movers and shakers in the state. And they felt it would be better for the federal government to do that. 
And after they went around for about an hour, um, nobody had asked me anything. I just was sitting there listening. I was the only investigator there. They'd bring in Bob Donovan or any from the state police. And Tim McNally nodded and said, I considered all that they had. And he just said he had two questions. And he said, these questions are going to be addressed to my agent, uh, my investigator, Eric Alpert. And the first question was, uh, do you believe Tom Capano kidnapped and murdered Anne-Marie Fahey? And I said, yes. Then he asked, can you solve this case? And I said, yes. And he wow. said, all right, we're in. We'll take the lead. And everybody exhaled in the room, and it went from a solemn uh, meeting to uh, to jovial because they were all off it. But we made sure they knew that they were all uh, out of it, that you know, even the attorney general's office, city police, everybody, they were out of the loop. That It was going federal. It was going to be run by the, by the FBI, and uh, and uh, going to be a grand jury case, and that they were uh, they were all out of it. All right. Well, I have to ask you this question. What gave you so much confidence that you could solve a case that for weeks, you know, they had not been able to gather any evidence or information that would lead to her being found? Well, we know with, you know, with all these other agencies and we're the FBI, I'm never going to say we can't solve something. I always believe you can solve something if you, you put enough into it. And I just, we could always, I could always solve it. And what about the people that had been investigating it, who had devoted so much of their time at the local and state level? Did you deputize those persons to well, work with you? How we set it up was uh, was that this was going to be uh, AUSA Colin Conley would be the prosecutive wing from the U.S. government. I would be uh, the lead investigator, and Bob Donovan from the city police would come over, but everybody else was going to be out of the loop. Uh, that's how we agreed to it at the meeting there. And at the, at the end of the meeting, they were all very happy. They all agreed, whatever resources, if you need anything, ask us and we'll give them to you. And I did call on it throughout the time, and they were, they were true to their word. They gave us whatever we needed. And I remember getting ready to go, and Tim McNally, who was the, uh, you know, the SAC, comes over to me, and everybody else has left, and he puts his arm on my shoulders, and he goes, Eric, this is the reason we become FBI agents to work cases like this. And I just nodded, and then we uh, sat down to try to figure out with the, the three of us what we were going to do on the case. Uh, it was Colin Conley, as I said, as the prosecutor, and Bobby Dunham and myself as is going to be doing the investigation. And we took over. We were going to do all the interviews. Now we did have other people who we brought on for specific things, and some of them I, I should mention here because uh, without them we couldn't have made this case. One of them was uh, Ron Poplos, who was a special agent with the IRS CID uh, division. Another one was uh, Doug Ardella, who was a city of Wilmington uh, detective, and his wife Diane Ardella, who was a uh, special agent with the uh, ATF. And they all helped at various aspects of the case, and their their contribution was critical to the success of this thing. Colm, uh, Bobby, and myself, we sat down and we looked, okay, what do we got here? We had no body. We had no eyewitness. We had no crime scene. We had no physical evidence of at any kind. And uh, the media was uh, constantly uh, all over the case. So at this point, we started to do the interviews, Bobby and myself. Uh, went to uh, Anne-Marie Faye's friends again. Asked about the, her relationship with Tom Capano. They were talking about how he was stalking her. He was threatening to expose her relationship and how she was afraid of her. Interviewed her therapist, and she said the same thing that she at the time that she was uh, afraid of Tom Capano, that he was stalking her. The therapist said that Anne Marie told her that if anything ever happened to her, it would be Tom Capano who did it. The therapist said she would not willingly have gone with him to Philadelphia. That he had to have either tricked her or forced her to go. We interviewed the uh, cleaning woman who cleaned Tom Capano's Grand Avenue home. She had said she'd been there June 24th, which was three days before Anne-Marie Faye went missing, and then she was back July 8th cleaning. We asked her if there was anything different, and she said yes. The In the great room, there was a uh, sofa that was missing and carpet that were missing and had been replaced with cheap stuff before the things there. She said were in great condition and were, uh, looked like they were very expensive. They had been replaced with... Uh, something that didn't fit the house. Reviewing Tom Capano's credit card information, we've gotten all of that. Saw that on June 29th, uh, which would be the uh, Friday, or be Saturday after she went missing, that he had been to a place called Airbase Carpet, went down and interviewed 
the salespeople at Air Base Carpet. They recognized Tom Capano. They said, yes, he came down there and he bought some cheap carpet there. Interviewed the uh, waitress up at Philadelphia at the restaurant who served them. And she said that uh, Anne-Marie Fahey looked solemn, uh, disheveled, unhappy during the uh, course of the dinner. And we interviewed the landlord. Now, all these people we're interviewing, we're taking him and putting him in front of the grand jury. We're locking in their testimony. In the meantime, the defense is constantly going to the media because we're always no comment. And they're talking about Tom Capano being a scapegoat. And what we were looking to do here was we were looking to get some kind of physical evidence. So the goal was, based on what we thought, was that if, when he brought her back, that he maybe brought her back to Delaware and he killed her at his Grand Avenue home. So we wanted to get into the Grand Avenue home to do a search on it. Even though we're several weeks later, we still would hope we could find something. In the uh, last week of uh, July 1996, uh, we prepared about a 40-page search warrant for the Grand Avenue home and for uh, Tom Capano's vehicles. Uh, it was defiant on it. Uh, took it to a federal magistrate who uh, signed off on it. We sealed it. I got on the phone prior. We knew we were going to have the warrant and when we were going to execute it. Talked to the FBI lab. Talked to our DNA people and blood people. And they were already aware of the case that had been getting media publicity. I told them what we were looking to do, going to a place five weeks after uh, we believe the homicide might have occurred. And they uh, gave us some advice, and they said they'd come up and help on the search. Got So we had them coming up. I got the Baltimore ERT. They were going to run the search. The uh, Delaware uh, State Police were going to bring their evidence team for the search. The city was going to bring in some of its evidence people, some city detectives and FBI agents from the Wilmington R.A., I have to stop for just for a second because I've been asked by some of the listeners to make sure that acronyms are uh, defined. So ERT is the Evidence Response Team. Correct. So uh, July 31st, we're going to execute the search warrant. A couple of us went to Tom Capano's door. We kept the whole army of searches uh, a couple of blocks away. Knocked on his door. He answered it. It was about 8.15 in the morning. and He's in his robe and his pajamas and identified as FBI. We have a search warrant for your house and your vehicles. It looked like somebody had punched him in the stomach. Uh, mm. I think it was because before he knew with his political connections, he thought he could control the investigation when the state was doing it. And now that he really saw that the FBI was involved, that he was playing on a different playing field there, that, uh, and that his political connections and his money may not be helped too much help here. He was uh, not, not looking happy and asked if he'd if I could interview him, he said no. He wanted to call his attorney. So I let him go ahead and call his attorney. His attorney was in control. So hopefully he's going to come pick him up, send him upstairs to get changed with two detectives and a couple of agents with the provision that everything that he takes or he puts on, we go through. He takes nothing out of here. We're looking for a bunch of things, including her personal items, especially a uh, heirloom ring that uh, was not at her home when we went through it after she went missing. So we thought maybe he had kept that there. They went upstairs, everybody gets called in, so now we have 50 people or so getting ready to do this search. Yeah. Cadaver dogs running around, uh, showing the uh, great room to the uh, evidence people who would specialize in that and they're putting on their Tyvek suits and getting ready to get down on their hands and knees and go through the, uh, the room uh, board by board or inch by inch. And I started hearing yelling from upstairs, yelling that he flushed something, he flushed something. And one of the city detectives who I'd worked some drugs with, uh, he immediately headed down to the basement to try to punch out the sewer line so whatever got flushed wasn't going to get out of the house. And they uh, come down and they tell me that they he was getting dressed. He pulled something out of his pocket and they told him to stop. He went right up to the toilet and flushed it before they could get to him. What it was, we, we never found out. Um, could have been anything. He said it was ashes, but he wasn't smoking. Could have been the ring that we were looking for, but we, we were never able to get it. He leaves with his attorney. Our people are doing the search of the house. Uh, it's pretty quiet. This is a very exclusive neighborhood. Big houses. Congressmen living a few doors down. And it's quiet there, even with all the people running around. I guess somebody notified the media because first one little truck shows up. And by 1030, the streets shut down because every media outlet is there with their satellite trucks turned on the TV. Every station is now live showing us trying to search with the dogs running around. 
Now, helicopters are flying over the uh, the house. I'm calling the FAA to get a, a flight restriction to get them away so we can do what we're doing without them uh, being right on top of us. And uh, while we're doing the search, don't find any of her personal items. We do find an inordinate amount of cleaning supplies. Go over in to the pharmacy where we saw from his credit card records he had made a purchase right after her disappearance. While they were searching, I drove over there with Bobby Donovan and found the person who was working there that day and asked them about uh, Tom Capano coming in. He identified Tom Capano as having come into the pharmacy and uh, purchased that on the date we were talking about. And he specifically said Tom Capano came up to him and asked him what's the best thing to get blood out with. And he bought a lot of it. Wow. Meanwhile, I went back. And they're still doing the search there. The media is all over there. Still everything's live on television there. And uh, the uh, evidence people, the blood people, saying uh, we think we we found something. Spent several hours on their hands and knees going through there, and they said they found uh, what they thought were two specks of blood. One on the uh, wooden baseboard by the wall, and another one on the uh, metal part of a radiator. They were tiny specks; you could barely see them. They uh, one was too small to test for anything at that point. But the other one had enough there that they could do a presumptive test for blood, and they did, and they found it was blood. So they went ahead and took those two samples out of there as evidence. We took the uh, all the cleaning supplies. We took the vacuums and all the hairs and fibers and some other other things there and uh, left the house at that point. Because we had found the, uh, found the blood there, I went out and quickly did a search warrant uh, compelling Tom Capano to we could give us blood and uh, hairs so we could match it up to see if that blood actually was his. The uh, lab people gave us a list of things that we could send them where they could uh, extract some DNA from Fran Marie Fahey so they could use that to match up uh, for a DNA profile to match up with what they found in the house. Problem was they called back and they said, uh, we can't find anything on here. Her hairbrush had no hair in it. Her toothbrush... They couldn't even find any saliva on it. Maybe now with modern things they could find better, but back then they couldn't. So now it was, how are we going to find something with her DNA to match up and determine whether that blood in the house was hers or whether it's somebody else's? So we had pulled everything off her desk from her workplace, including her calendar, and I was flipping through that, and I saw that two weeks earlier. There was a notation about a blood bank. And I'll call the blood bank, call the blood bank. And they said, yes, she did come in. Went over and talked to them. And they said she gave blood, but they said they don't keep the blood. They take the blood and they spin it into plasma and then ship it out overseas. Talk to the lab people. And they said, well, the way to spin something in the plasma means you take all the cells out so it won't be useful to us. But go ahead and try to get it back if it still exists because a lot of times when they do it, there are cells still left in. So I got hold of the blood bank and said, we need it back now. Do I, don't, I didn't need a quarter. They said they'd get it immediately for me. They called over. It was still in existence. I think it was in Switzerland. They had it expedited back as soon as it got back. we uh, Bob Dunno and I drove it right down to uh, to the lab, dropped it off there. And before we got back to Wilmington, which is probably about a two-and-a-half, three-hour drive, uh, they were already calling, saying they'd looked at it, and there were cells in there. Wow. And that uh, these uh, cells uh, were sufficient for them to put together a DNA profile. And eventually they matched it up and they said, yes, it's, uh, that's her blood in the uh, in, in his place. So at least we had, you know, had some physical evidence. Of course, after that search with it being all over the news, we had some people calling and one of them who called in was a uh, project manager who worked uh, for Louis Capano one of Tom's brothers who had taken over the construction company. And he said uh, he thought something was suspicious. He got a call on July 1st from Louis Capano that uh, they wanted a dumpster at one of their sites uh, immediately pulled and dumped. And that cost money to do. He went over and looked at the dumpster, and it wasn't scheduled to be pulled, and it was uh, only about half full. He, he didn't see anything out of the ordinary in it. And he called back. He said, you sure you want this poll? And he was ordered, get it out now. So that, that concerned him. We had already been looking at the toll records and pen registers and toll backs and everything. And we saw that right after Anne Marie's disappearance, that Tom Capano and Louis Capano had been speaking that whole weekend uh, a couple of times. So we thought there was some 
connection between the two of them. And now with this call to this project manager who is being told to get rid of this immediately, it raised a lot of suspicions. So we, we're going to try to figure out what was in those dumpsters. And the way to do that would be to find out where they were dumped and then to try to dig up what was dumped. Uh, we didn't expect to find a body there, but we were hoping for a, a sofa or a, a or, or the carpet hmm. that right. was missing from out of the house. I well, went to the dump, figured where which dump it went to, went to the dump, watched what they did there. They'd come in there and they'd dump uh, things, the garbage out there, and then they'd have these huge bulldozers crush it down to about an inch in diameter, then pick it up and dump it into the ground along with the personal garbage of people from their houses and bury it. So looking at that, I said, we're never going to be identify a sofa. It'll be crushed down to, to nothing. But a rug stays and keeps its shape. So talking to the people at the dump, we were able to get about a 100-yard area, went over there and do, did some test digs at those places to find newspapers with dates around what we were looking for. Then the Baltimore Evidence Response Team came up and people from the FBI agents from the Wilmington Resident Agency and the state and the city police and state police. And for the next five, six days, we dug up the dump in the middle of August and uh, huh. the high humidity, the high heat with thunderstorms rolling through and uh, up to our uh, knees and muck and the stench of a dump. And we pulled up every carpet we could find in that area and tested each one of them for blood, but uh, we didn't find anything. Of course, later on, we figured out why the, the carpet went somewhere else. But that's where we were then. We dug all that up. So now we're looking harder at Louis Capano based on that. We knew that he had spoken with Tom from the uh, phone records. We tried to interview him. He said he knew nothing. And at the same time, we had other court stuff going on. Uh, the media was trying to unseal the affidavits uh, we had used for the search warrant and for the blood of uh Tom Capano, they wanted it unsealed so they could get a look at him. Uh, the defense joined in. They didn't want them unsealed. They wanted them unsealed only for them so they could review them and then have them resealed. At that point, the government, you know, through us, we all decided, go ahead and just unseal them at this point. We're further along in the investigation anyway and just let them have it. It'll maybe uh, create more publicity. We'll get more people coming forward. And they were unsealed, and uh, again, there was a major media frenzy for that because they announced when they were going to do it. They were all standing on the courthouse steps, uh, going live on television, reading excerpts from it as as they're walking down the steps. Before they even finished it, they were going through all the uh, all the things there. Yeah, I remember it well. I really do. It was definitely a, a media event. The uh, defense is uh, now putting out articles and, and talking to the media about the FBI and saying uh, the FBI's tactics are horrible, the FBI's scapegoating Tom Capano. Uh, and then it turned from the FBI, they knew I was the lead investigator, and they started uh, making the attacks uh, coming uh, coming against uh, me personally, where the, the headline would be FBI lied, and then the subheadline would be Agent Alpert has concocted a story. He's lying. He's uh, trying to uh, to uh, railroad Tom Capano, and they put a picture of me in the paper. They, I guess, uh, they, I was known by the media before this case, so they knew I was. And when I'd be going in and out of the FBI building where the building was there, they'd be out there taking pictures for a while. So they always had these file photos, and you did a different one each time. And, FBI tactics was one headline, and uh, Agent Alpert's trying to assassinate the character of Tom Capano. Agent Alpert is uh, a liar, concocter of stories. Uh, so it seemed every week there was a different one of those uh, uh, coming out there. Uh, well, they knew I was the lead investigator, so they were looking at the, putting out those stories. They also did stuff at court there. Uh, not too long into the uh, into this thing, they filed a uh, motion in federal court to hold me uh, personally in contempt of court for releasing grand jury information. Got called to the U.S. Attorney's Office, and they handed me uh, the motion, 80 pages of them attacking me and my tactics, but saying that I was releasing grand jury information in violation of Rule 6E, and that I should be held in contempt. Uh, they were telling me that, uh, you know, they're trying to get you off the case for whatever reason, uh, for some reason, I guess they didn't like me. But, you know, the U.S. Attorney's Office, they asked, uh, did you release anything? And I said, no, I know who released it. It was one of the witnesses. 
witnesses aren't bound by grand jury secrecy. They can go to talk to anybody they want. And they said, how do you know? I said, well, I was talking to the witness and his attorney and uh, I was explaining that to him that uh, the grand jury secret, but not not with regard to you guys. And uh, they immediately called that attorney. The attorney said, yes, it was us. We just kept our name out of the uh, out of the press and out of the TV. Uh, it was uh, NBC News had done something on it. And they sent an affidavit over the U.S. Attorney's Office to that effect. The next day, we have the big the big hearing where they want to hold me in contempt. To go over there, and the uh, they have their Tom Kripen has several attorneys, and they're sitting there, and they go, hey, they just get up and they go on for a while about the tactics and how I should be held in contempt, and that uh, it was horrible, everything, whatever, and. Uh, the government gets up, Colin Connolly gets up, and he, he says, uh, uh, Agent Albert I did not release this. It was released by one of the witnesses, and he was an affidavit from his attorney. It took him all, about a minute to say that. The judge looked at it and said dismissed, and that was the end of that. A couple of months later, they tried it again on something else. Uh, I didn't even go to that hearing there. It was ridiculous. Uh, and uh, I heard at that time, after. The judge dismissed it. Uh, the judge uh, gave them a hard time saying, uh, before you impugn the uh, the reputation of an uh, FBI agent, you should have your facts straight. So mm-hmm. the, they sort of stopped up with that uh, with that track there. But uh, there were other things going on. Uh, I remember one evening at 3 a.m., phone rings. I pick it up. There's, there's nobody on the line there. You can hear them, somebody breathing, but nobody will answer. I cursed them out, hung up. Next morning, I'm in with Bob Donovan and Colin Conley, and I mentioned it, and uh, Bob Donovan says the same thing. He said, you know, I got a call right around 3 a.m., and somebody was breathing on there. And Colin Conley says, I got one, too, and we all have unlisted home phone numbers there. Colin Conley went to the U.S. attorney, uh, Greg Sleet there with it, and uh, Greg was, con- was concerned. We ended up having put pen registers on our phones and trap and traces. We ended up figuring out where the phone number came from. It came out of Pennsylvania, but it uh, couldn't be tracked. It was to, a, I believe, a pay phone. So we could never figure out who had, uh, who had decided to do that. Also, during this time, I had a private investigator who I knew. He was a former uh, detective of the city of Wilmington I had worked with, and he came by the, uh, by the office there, and he said he wanted to tell me to, to watch my back, that he was hearing from other PI, private investigators from other states, that someone was reaching out, they didn't say who, to hire somebody to follow follow me around to get dirt on me. Another, two days later, another PI who I never had seen before, who was out of Pennsylvania, comes in and he says he's he former law enforcement. And uh, he felt he was morally obligated to tell me because he was seeing what was going on with the case. And he said people were reaching out to hire somebody from out of state, a PI, to follow me, which more concerned me about them seeing who I was meeting with because we were now starting to meet with people who were cooperating and getting ready to put an undercover into the thing. Yeah, I didn't even think about that. So instead of just using this information to harass you and to try to dig up any type of dirt they could, now they're going to be able to see you know, any cooperating witnesses or you know people that you have told would be confidential you know information. Now they can see who those people are. That's correct. So uh, literally about three or four days after that, I'm going out to get the newspaper at like six thirty or whatever in the morning, and I see a car up the street from where I live, and I can see somebody in there, and he's got a camera. So I figured, well, I'm going to go find out who this is. So I started heading up at him at, as fast as I can run there. And whoever it was, they threw it into gear and, and, and hit out of there before I could get close enough to see the plates. So uh, I don't know who it was or whether it might have been somebody from the media because everybody in Delaware, it's a small area. Everybody knows where everybody lives there. Uh, it's not some big secret. Uh, had some other had some vandalism to the house. Had a tire on a car slashed out in front of my house. Yeah, that was my personal car. So they were, uh, there was a bunch of things going on there. That's unfortunately what happens when you're working a, a, a high-profile case like this. That, that's right. Uh, but, you know, some of it being high-profile uh, helps you out some, too. Uh, got a call from a retired FBI agent. He had retired several years before I got there. He was in his late 70s uh, when he called me, and he said after he retired, he was now he had gone to work for the Delaware State Bar Association as an investigator. 
And he told me that 15 years earlier, he had done an investigation of a young attorney by the name of Tom Capano, who was trying to uh, beat up or break the legs or kill uh, a former mistress of his who was no longer doing what he wanted to do. So I went out and was interviewing him, and he talked about it. He said he got a call. Uh, he wasn't investigating it through the state bar. He got a call from a former informant of his who had been involved on uh, some of the LCN things he had worked. And that informant of his, he knew, was someone who was uh, an enforcer. And this guy said, uh, told him, hey, this young attorney, guy named Tom Capano, a Delaware attorney, is uh, asking me to do these things, and uh, you know, I'm out of that type of stuff now, and uh, what should I do? Well, the retired agent said, uh, record these conversations. So the two of them recorded conversations with Tom Capano, telling him that uh, this was a former mistress of his. Uh, he broke up, uh, she broke up with him, not her, him with her. So he was upset with that. He told her because she was a paralegal working in Wilmington that uh, she had to leave the city. That Wilmington was his city. He controlled Wilmington and the state of Delaware, and she couldn't work there anymore. And she was refusing, so he wanted this former enforcer to go to her and tell her to get out of the city and if she refused to break her legs and then to do worse if she continued to refuse. So he had all that on tape. I said, you still have the tapes? And we go into his garage and he's pointing, look over here, look over there. Finally, if we dig through some of it, I found this manila envelope, picked it up, felt like tapes, and he said, that's it. And uh, those tapes were very important, mostly for the death penalty phase of the case because they were they were played uh, loud and clear for her to see what his predisposition was with regard to this type of thing. When had those tapes been made? When had he threatened that 15, girlfriend? About 15 years earlier, from uh, back in the 80s, uh, so about 15 years earlier when he was a young attorney before he uh, became a, a partner in a law firm. He had, had uh, an affair with her and knew he had a lot of sexual relations with a lot of women as long as he was the one who called it off. It was fine. He didn't like it when... Uh, but wouldn't stand for it when someone else would uh, would end it with him. He had a he was very power and control hungry and uh, thought he was uh, above everybody that he with his money and everything and his connections could do whatever he wanted there. Uh, while this is still going on, it's you know getting towards January of '97. Bob Donovan and myself were interviewing people, and we've done probably well over a hundred interviews, probably more. I've never tracked it all. And these are all the movers and shakers of Delaware. These are people in high political office and attorneys who are well respected in the town there and other people of wealth. And uh, most of them were not happy to be dragged into it because uh, some of them were uh, Tom's wingman sometimes or there were women who uh, were also uh, involved sexually with Tom and those are the type of questions we're asking. We're asking about now Tom Capano's demeanor, Tom Capano's reaction when he's being, when he's dealing with women, his violence maybe towards women. The ones who didn't have any involvement didn't want to be involved in the case. They just didn't want, they were worried about their own reputations. A lot of them were calling, I know, the U.S. Attorney's Office complaining uh, about me. They were calling the SAC in Baltimore, and, and I got some feedback, and then the feedback was just keep doing what you're doing. Uh, you're not here to make everybody make people happy. You're here to solve the case. I remember one of them. He was a an attorney who was good friends with Tom Capano, and he actually, I'm sure, he thought he could uh, outwit us or whatever in an interview. And we were, we were going on about the third hour. Then he just stood up and he said, "This is it. Uh, I'm done." Because he'd started to get into areas I guess he didn't want to get into. He was talking about Tom Capano's propensity to violence and propensity of violence towards women, and he just realized that. He got up, he uh, stormed out, and he called the U.S. Attorney's Office started complaining that I had tricked him into saying things that he, that he now wanted to take back. Uh, and we were interviewing his ex, uh, well, it was still his current mistress at the time. She uh, was still a loyal supporter of his and re went to interview her. She had to have an attorney with her. I'm sure Tom was paying for it. And uh, that interview lasted about 10 minutes. He started screaming at me uh, that I was the devil at one point, and uh, it started to get hysterical, so they, they took her out, and that was the end of that interview. We had some people telling us that they had been with Tom and had been involved in some of his sexual escapades. Make it uncomfortable for people. Let them come forward and tell, what's, uh, tell the truth here, because I was finding more 
more integrity and honesty in my dealings with uh, some of these drug dealers. And I was finding with the uh, the top echelon people in the in the uh, state of Delaware, uh, supposedly the movers and shakers and the honest people there in the boardrooms, but. That's kind of sad that they were worried about their own reputations more so than bringing justice to this woman who most likely is dead. They're worried about their reputations and about their economics, too, because the Capano family is very wealthy. And uh, I believe that Tom Capano was made a partner in that law firm, not so much for his legal expertise, but for his ability to bring in money to the law firm through the family and uh, you know, we're continuing to do a lot of interviews talking to all these people. And some of them, you know, because I've worked, did a lot of interviews over the course of my career up to that point. So did Bob Donovan. And we could tell who was being more forthcoming with us and who was out and out lying. And then you had another group that there were people there who you knew wanted to tell you something, but just wouldn't wouldn't do it. I would just keep going back to them. I mean, if they said they had an attorney and go through the attorney, I'd still reach out to them. There was one in particular I just felt that person just really wanted to, to say something. But they wouldn't. I went back to them two, three times. Uh, nothing to lose. Just keep going back and being persistent. And uh sat in the car and got a call on the radio. Secretary saying, uh, someone just called in here. They were remaining anonymous. But they say they have some uh, information that you uh, could help you in the Capano case. They want you to meet them by yourself, bring no one with you at the uh, at a diner outside of Philly. So I said, all right, uh, and it was 3.30 that afternoon. Headed up there, and as soon as I walked into the diner, I uh, recognized who it was. It had been that person I kept going back to. And they ended up giving us a real key piece of uh, of evidence there. Uh, they uh, told me that Tom Capano had placed some papers that were written in his own handwriting in the uh, book cabinet of one of the partners in the law firm in, the, in that person's office because Tom Capano didn't want to keep it in his office because he uh, felt that the FBI was going to search his office and would find it. So uh, we went in there and we, we got the uh, got it, and it turned out to be uh, very important. It was 10 pages in Tom Capano's own handwriting about his relationship with Anne Marie Fahey. A lot of it was self-serving as to what he was going to say if, uh, yeah, if ever went to court. But the key piece was a uh, timeline for June 28th. And in that timeline, it didn't say, hey, went out to Stone Harbor, New Jersey and dumped the body. But it said 6.30 a.m., Jerry Capano at the house. Go with Jerry Capano to Stone Harbor, New Jersey. We were at Jerry Capano's his youngest brother. We'd already started looking at that because we had their cell phones and uh, their info. And we'd done interviews out there. And we knew that Jerry had been out in... Uh, Stone Harbor, New Jersey, uh, with Tom uh, the day after Emory Faye went missing. And Jerry Capano was the youngest of the Capano brothers. He, uh, 15 years younger than Tom, married at the time, had two young children. Jerry uh, did not work. He lived off his trust fund. He had a big home in Wilmington. He had a big home in Stone Harbor, New Jersey, right on the water, where he kept his uh, very expensive uh, ocean-going boat that he would use to go out and do shark fishing and go out a couple hundred miles into the Atlantic. And when he wasn't doing that, he was big game hunting around the, the world there, shooting animals and stuffing them and bringing them home. And when he wasn't doing that, he was in his garage uh, working on his race car with his, uh, a bunch of his uh, friends. Most of them either didn't have a job or had menial jobs and sort of like his entourage of, of people who would hang out with him. We'd already been looking at Jerry, but we didn't think that if we went straight to him, he would tell us the truth. We'd already had that problem with Louis Capano. So we were trying to figure out how we could get to Jerry and see what we could get out of him, maybe have something that we could use on him. And that's when we uh, came up with our uh, undercover investigative technique there. It was something that I'd used virtually every case I'd had in some form or another, either an undercover uh, agent type or a, a cooperating witness who would work almost as an undercover agent brought it up to the supervisor, Tim, and he was all for it. And SAC, Tim McNally, was all for it. The U.S. Attorney's Office was was agreed to it. And so we really had nothing to lose at this time. So we were able to insert somebody in with Jerry uh, and Jerry's group of pals there. 
which was manpower intensive for Bob Donovan and myself because we weren't going to send him in with a recorder on, but we wanted the recorder was going on, so we'd send him in with a transmitter. We needed to record everything, possible uh, trial or whatever later on. So we, Bobby Donovan and I, we had to be close enough to record it and listen to it. Of course, with Jerry and his pals, that, that only occurred. Uh, they didn't start doing their thing till like 6 or 7 at night, till 2 or 3 in the morning, messing around with the race car or whatever they were doing. And uh, most of it was gibberish and a bunch of uh, 30-year-old somethings uh, drinking and, and flapping their gums about uh, inane things. Uh, so every night we were out there, the only break we would get was and Jerry would leave uh, the area, the state or whatever to go uh, big game hunting. But we were out there every night dealing with that. And after a few months, we realized Jerry wasn't going to say anything specific about his being with Tom or what happened that day. We did know that he had some involvement. We didn't think he was involved in, in the homicide, but we believed he was involved in the body disposal. And the undercover got that sense, too. We got recordings, but nothing specific with regard what you could use in, in a court that would show, yeah, Jerry was involved. You could tell he at the times when they'd get him talking about it, which was rare, he would uh, express remorse and express remorse for being involved, but he wouldn't give any specifics. I have to ask you this question because, you know, I'm fully aware of our use of of the FBI's use of undercover. And usually there's a way of introducing somebody to an organization or to a company. But I can't imagine how you introduce a UCA to a group of friends that, you know, how they would embrace this stranger that just shows up and I want to be friends with you. Well, you know, hypothetically, they could meet a couple of them that they know at a bar and uh, befriend them there and then get in with that group, and then that group takes them in with the other group, and then you're part of the group. Fascinating. I mean, it really is fascinating that you thought of it and that it worked. I mean, you may not have found the information that you wanted. You, You may not have gathered the information, but the fact that the introduction was successful is is really amazing. Well, from the uh, the undercover, we didn't get any specifics there, but we did get one thing. We saw that Jerry was involved in some illegal activity, and that was his use of cocaine. He used a lot of cocaine, and he was a very generous host. He would uh, give out cocaine at parties to his friends and to uh, anybody else who was there to be a distributor of trafficking weight. You don't have to sell it as long as you're giving it out. So based on what we were getting from the undercover, we had enough to show that he was. we could probably charge him federally with distribution. Uh, we also had him buying firearms and checking the boxes on there under penalty of law, the federal forms that uh, state you're not a drug user, and he was checking, no, well, we had plenty of evidence to show that he was. So we started looking at it at that angle. Let's see if we, if we jam him up, we can bring him in, and then he can get him to talk to us and tell us specifically what happened on June 29th when he met with Tom. Before you move on, I just have one other question. I want to backtrack Mm -hmm. a little bit. This 10-page document that you were able to find in another attorney's office, why would Tom Capano write such a document and then trust someone with that? Well, a lot of it was self-serving, what you read in there, that it was what he was going to say. To uh, if he was ever arrested, or what he would say to the media about it, if he would have a big press conference. Because at some point, uh, we learned that he had a publicist, and they were talking about how he was going to, as this case, if this case dragged on and nothing ever happened, that he would uh, go to the go public and say, "I took a polygraph and uh, I passed." And even whether he did or not, he was going to say it because they'd get their own polygrapher to do it. And, he had all his statements in there of how she was flighty and erratic, and he had examples of that. And the uh, timeline, it didn't say anything about him uh, killing and dumping a body. It said he went out to Stone Harbor, and his story was he was out there uh, with Jerry looking at property because he was thinking of buying a place for his kids to use that day. He's setting an alibi. He said it uh, his alibi in that. Okay. So now we're looking at Jerry with regard to the, to the drugs there, and from what the undercover could tell us is the amount we learned who one of Jerry's sellers, who one of his drug dealers, would give him the drugs. Whereas when we jammed him up and uh, made him a deal, he couldn't refuse, and he quad being cooperating with us. We also learned from the undercover when Jerry's next party was going to be, and when Jerry was going to be flush with drugs in the house. There, at that point, we got a search warrant, hit his house, found the drugs in the house. 
seize them, seize his 20 some odd guns that were in the house. Didn't arrest him. He called Tom. Tom sent Charles Overly over. But we mentioned to him it would be best if he got himself his own attorney and not relied on Tom for this because he was the one who jammed up here, not Tom. And we didn't arrest him. We wanted to let him stew. At this point, we started then bringing in all his friends into the grand jury and getting them to uh, testify about how much uh, cocaine that he had distributed to them so we could add to the weight for what the charges would be. Jerry uh, hired as his attorney, a former assistant United States attorney, Dan Lyons. Dan Lyons started to reach out to Colin Conley, found out the evidence against Jerry. Jerry decided to cut a deal where Jerry would come in and uh, take a plea to a federal crime of misprison of a felony, which would be kidnapping, and uh, then give us a full statement of what went on. And in November 1996, Jerry came in, uh, did the meeting away from the FBI and U.S. Attorney's Office at the uh, IRS Criminal Investigative Division's office, which was outside the city. We made sure we did it after dark so nobody could see what was going on. And they came in and Jerry gave us his statement, which uh, was uh, some of it was something we didn't expect. What we didn't expect was he told us that in February of 1996, Tom Capano would come to him and had told uh, told Jerry that two people were extorting a man and a woman, and they needed Jerry to give him some cash so it couldn't be traced back to Tom, and to give him a gun because if he couldn't pay them off, he was going to have to kill him, and he might need Jerry to help him get rid of the bodies. And, using his boat that was at Stone Harbor. Jerry gave him the money, gave him the gun, didn't hear anything after that. Tom gave him back the gun a couple of months later, hadn't been fired according to Jerry. And they didn't hear anything about it again until the uh, June 28th, which was that Friday after Henry Faye went missing. Jerry uh, said he, it's about 6.30 in the morning, he gets a phone call from his brother Tom, and Tom says, I'm in your driveway. And Jerry comes out to talk to him, and Tom says, uh, I need your boat on Stone Harbor. Now, Tom has never used a boat. Tom knows nothing about boats. Tom, if he got in a boat, wouldn't, wouldn't be able to get it away from the dock. And Jerry says, uh, did you do it? Meaning, did you shoot these people? And Tom nodded yes. He said, let me have the key. Let me have your boat. And Jerry says, there's no way you can use that boat and get out in the ocean and do it. You don't know how to do it. You've never driven one. You've never been out in the ocean. So now Jerry is going to help Tom. And they go over to Tom's house on Grand Avenue. They, uh, Open up the uh, garage. In the garage, Jerry sees a uh, cooler, big igloo cooler with a, a chain and a lock on it. He sees a sofa with blood on it, and he sees a rolled up carpet. They load the uh, the cooler into uh, to Tom Capano Suburban, and they start to uh, drive out, and they go out to Stone Harbor, New Jersey. They then load the uh, cooler onto uh, Jerry's boat. Jerry drives him about uh, 75 miles out into the Atlantic to a place where he shark fishes, known as uh, Mako Alley. They throw the cooler into the ocean there, but doesn't sink. It's too buoyant. Jerry pulls out his shotgun he uses for shark fishing and fires uh, two shotgun slugs through the cooler. Begins to take on water, but it still doesn't sink. Jerry pulls the boat over to the uh, cooler there. They, they grapple it and pull it over. Tom starts fiddling with it. Jerry goes over and hands him two anchors from the boat. And then he turns his back and says, I'm, I'm not going any further with this. He hears Tom behind him opening up the lock in the cooler. And then he hears a little bit later a splash in the water. At that point, Jerry turns around and he sees a foot going into the ocean. They then uh, both take the cooler apart. They unscrew the, uh, the lid to the cooler, throw that into the ocean. They leave the rest of the cooler to float away. And they head back to Jerry's place in Stone Harbor. Then they get into Tom's car and they drive back to Grant Avenue, the home there. Jerry smashes up the sofa and they take it to Louis Capano's uh, dump, dumpster that we talked about earlier. And they throw that the pieces of that into there. Tom says he's going to take care of the carpet. And he did. He took it up to a Holiday Inn that the family owned up in New Jersey and put it in a dumpster there. So that ended up getting dumped somewhere completely different than where we had been digging before. Did you believe his brother Jerry that he had no idea whose body was in that cooler? Or was that just something for him to be able to mitigate his guilt? Yeah, I, be- I believe Jerry. I don't think Jerry Jerry didn't know what Tom was up. Jerry and Tom didn't travel in the same circles I mean, at, at all there. Jerry was doing his Jerry thing of hunting and fishing and uh, race car riding and hanging out with his entourage of pals and going to strip joints where he would pay the bill for everybody and doing his thing, and Tom ran in his circle, so I don't think Jerry had any idea who it was. 
till all of this started hitting the news. I mean, probably didn't wouldn't have known Anne Marie Fay if she had rang his doorbell. And Jerry lets his brother Louis know what he had done. Louis then comes in with his attorneys to cut his deal to avoid jail time. He pleads guilty to a federal offense. I think the same one Jerry did. Uh, Louis gives his story there that Tom called him that weekend, said that he was uh, had a girlfriend uh, who he was breaking up with. She was over his house, and after he broke up with her, he went upstairs, and she split her wrist and committed suicide, and he needed to get rid of some of the evidence, uh, personal items, and uh, some of the blood stuff, and Louis said, go ahead and throw it in my dumpster, and we'll get rid of it. So those two would come in. We had an FBI surveillance team that was on Tom Capano, and they'd been on him for a couple of weeks now, 24-7, because we, we, we believed that Jerry was going to come in, and this thing was going to come to our head at, at this point. Our strategy was we were going to go ahead and indict Tom Capano on federal kidnap murder charges. We arrest him, bring him to the U.S. Attorney's Office first, call his attorneys in, and then give him the choice. The uh, state attorney general, she would be there as well. His choice would be plead guilty to federal kidnap murder and get 30 years in prison or not take that plea and you'll be immediately charged uh, with uh, first-degree murder in the state of Delaware with the death penalty. The surveillance team is on him. We're getting ready. The next day we were going to do this, the surveillance team calls me up carrying around the radio that I've been talking to them now for two weeks, 24-7. They're always updating me what he's doing, where he's at. And they uh, tell me that they see him at a house putting suitcases in the car and starting to head north. And north would be on I-95 up to the Philadelphia International Airport, which is probably closer to Wilmington, Delaware than it is to Philadelphia. And we had talked to the brothers about him fleeing if he, and they had already said that he had talked about at one point leaving the country during the course of this thing to get away from it all. With his money and resources, there was always a distinct possibility. So now the surveillance team's on him. He's heading north, talking to Colm Connolly. I said, you know, our whole plan is we have to take him off here in Delaware. He gets into Pennsylvania, we have to rest at the airport because he's not going to get on a plane, that's for sure. And that's never going to happen, but if he gets... Into Pennsylvania, he's going to have to go to a magistrate in Pennsylvania. He's not coming back here to Delaware. So our whole thing of setting him up with his attorneys and getting him to make a choice right then and there is going to work. We need to take him off, and we need to take him off by in the next five minutes because that's about how close he is to getting out of the state. He agreed. He said, let's take him off now. I get on with the surveillance team. I said, arrest him. Don't let him go over the line. And they put on their sirens. I got to hear it on the radio. As before they clicked off, said they were going to take him down and they called, they arrested him, they got him while he was still in Delaware. I said, you know, bring him back, bring him back to the U.S. Attorney's Office. Was there evidence in the car that indicated that he was going to the airport, that he was trying to flee? He says he wasn't. Suitcases, they said, were for his brother. Uh, he had money with him, but he always carried a lot of cash, I think a thousand bucks or so with him all the time. So we don't we don't know. I mean, he, he maybe he wasn't, uh, but at that point it was all moot anyway. We already had him, so just uh, going ahead of schedule, doing the same thing we were going to do anyway. They started calling his attorneys and he'd been arrested and we were bringing him back to the U.S. Attorney's Office. Got a hold of the State Attorney General said, uh, this is what we're, you know, he's been arrested. It's ahead of schedule here, but this is what's going on, going down now. Brought him back into the conference room. His all attorneys eventually showed up there. We showed, put out the evidence against him and played the statements of his brothers. We recorded those. Against his attorney's advice, he, of course, had to say something. He said, Jerry is a, is a drug-addled liar. And, and he said, my other brother, Louis, is just an out and out liar. And that was the end of that. He refused to take the plea, so he was going to be charged immediately with the first-degree murder, premeditated murder in the uh, state by the state of Delaware. The agreement that they had reached was that even if prosecution was going to be in state court, it would still remain everything with the FBI and the U.S. Attorney's Office. Colm Connolly would be cross-designated to prosecute the case, and that a prosecutor from the Attorney General's Office first, Wharton, would be the co-prosecutor on the case, but all the evidence and everything else would remain with the with the federal government on it. At that point, Tom's arrested. It's all over the news. Everybody's out there. The helicopters are flying over. It's the lead story. They're cutting into TV and everything else. Newspapers have the arrest warrant pretty much in there, word for word. The main thing in there that was different was that he killed her and tried to dump her body with a cooler in the ocean. Next morning, we go over to the FBI office and with Bob Donovan, we're getting everything ready because we figured they're going to try to have a probable cause hearing because the defense attorneys were already screaming and wanted that immediately. And we knew there'd be a bail hearing coming up. So we're trying to put stuff together. And uh, in the morning, 
phone call comes in, the secretary says there's somebody on the phone, they want to talk to you, pointing at me about the cooler, that they have information about it. And I said, all right, that's, that's fine, I'll take the call. I figured, well, this will be the first of many because this is the first time a cooler has been mentioned. It was in the newspaper, so now everybody knows about a cooler. So I take it, and the guy starts talking about how uh, a bunch of people were out fishing that weekend, where she vanished and around July 4th, and that they had said they found a cooler floating in the ocean. I said, all right, well, can you uh, describe it? And he says, well, yeah, it was missing a lid and had two shotgun holes in it. But that was not what I was expecting to hear. I said, all right, you wouldn't happen to know where it is now? He said, yeah, it was a brand new cooler with a couple holes in it. We pulled the cooler out, epoxied it, and uh, took out a, a lid off an old cooler of the same size and we've been using it for the last year and a half. I said, well, where is it? He mentioned it was down at a beach place they had in lower Delaware by the beaches, and it was in a shed in the back, which was locked. It had a combination lock on it. I said, well, we want it. We want it now. He said, hey, go be my guest. Go get it. I'm not down there. Go get it. Bob Dunno and I went down uh, at very rapid speed down to there. And, of course, he neglected to tell us that there was a gate around his house and a fence. And he didn't give us that. It was locked with a padlock, so we had to climb the fence. But the combination to the shed worked. And after we dug around and looked back there, there it was, sitting in the shed covered with stuff. And it perfectly matched what he said. You could see where the holes were epoxied. Now we had the uh, the cooler, which really became a key piece of, of evidence because that really destroyed a lot of his defense. His defense was going to be that Jerry was a drug addle hallucinating from all the drugs and Lewis was lying to get himself out of trouble. Now this cooler completely corroborated everything that uh, Jerry had told us. Uh, then we go uh, to the bail hearing. Bail hearings usually last a couple of hours. This one went on for three days, the longest they ever had. I know I was on the witness stand for a day. At the end, he was denied bail. Meanwhile, ATF was tracking firearms for us. They'd been looking to see if anybody in his family or any of the people we kept giving them names for had bought a firearm. They were checking Debbie McIntyre. They'd found that in May, about a month before Anne Maria went missing, she had bought a firearm. And we had the date stamp and everything where she bought it. We matched it up with Tom Capano's cell phone records and showed he was right there in that area. Initially, when we interviewed her about it, she uh, didn't exactly tell the truth. She was still a Tom Capano fan. Eventually, uh, that fell apart, and she realized what was going on. And then she told the truth that Tom had taken her there, told her what gun to buy. She went in and bought it and handed it to him. So now we had a, a gun. We didn't know where it was, but we had knew he had possession of a gun. Now, he's in prison for this time, and they're getting ready to go to trial. Well, prison, he's charged uh, by the state with soliciting to uh, try to murder Jerry Capano and Debbie McIntyre. He's trying to get other prisoners, get people from the outside to kill them. So he got charged with that while he was doing that. And we got to the trial. We didn't know what the strategy was going to be at the beginning. We figured based on what they've been doing for the last several months, they were going to attack the investigation, attack the investigators. I'm sure it was because of the cooler. They came in with the opening statement that... The death of Anne Marie Fay was a horrible, terrible accident. That it was, uh, Debbie McIntyre showed up, saw Tom and Marie making out on the couch, took out a gun and was going to put it to her head and kill herself. And that Tom ran across her and stopped that and hit her arm and the gun went off and hit, went across her and the bullet killed Anne Marie Fay. And that was literally their defense there. And the trial went on for five plus months. At the end, he was uh, found uh, guilty by the jury of first-degree murder. Then we had the death penalty phase with the, the tapes done by the uh, by the retired agent about uh, him trying to solicit something to be killed uh, were played. And the jury came back 11 to 1 for the death penalty. And, and that's what he was sentenced to, sentenced to death based on the jury's recommendation. A few years later, while he was making as many appeals, the uh, Supreme Court ruled that uh, any death penalty recommendation had to be unanimous. So since it was 11 to 1, that was thrown out. And then the question was whether we redo the death penalty phase to get him the death penalty. And like, an agreement was cut with his attorneys and with the prosecution and with the uh, victim's family that we wouldn't redo that if he agreed to life in prison without the possibility of parole and no more appeals. And for him, that was easy because he'd lost every appeal so far to that point and was running out of things to appeal. 
he died of natural causes in prison in, in 2012. Wow. I do want to go back where he said that Debbie McIntyre was there when Anne Marie was killed. Was was there any truth to that? She denied it. We couldn't find any reason she'd be there. Okay, very good. And how long did this case take from the beginning of the investigation until the moment that he was sentenced to life in prison without parole? She disappeared June 27, 96. She was arrested November 12th of 97. Trial, he was convicted uh, in January of 99. So almost three years of your life devoted to this one investigation. Working a lot of other cases, too. I was still running the task forces at the time, so I was running around with that as well. But most of my time was spent on, the, on, on this investigation up until we arrested him. So we know what happened to Anne-Marie Fahey. A body was never found. The U.S. Navy went out with new side, side scanner sonar that they had at the time, and I believe they took Jerry Capano with them on the, uh, on the whatever boat they used there, vessel they used, and he took them out to that area, and they, they did a couple of days trying to find any body, and they, they didn't find any. Well, let me ask a few questions about you. When did you join the FBI, and why did you join the FBI? What, what's your story? Well, I joined the FBI in 1982. Went to law school and uh, was really interested in practicing law. I was always interested in law enforcement, and uh, went ahead and applied to the FBI and was able to get on board. And that's pretty much it. I was always interested in the FBI. I like to give my guest the opportunity to have the last word. What would you like to say? I'd like to just say that you know I had a great career with the FBI, 25 years. I uh, thoroughly enjoyed uh, everything I did. I had the opportunity to work a lot of different things. Uh, besides this case, I got to work closely with the local police on other cases and oftentimes just work uh, local police matters. I worked in long-term investigations with solely FBI people. I was in the uh, behavioral analysis unit for a while. Enjoyed that as well, and then uh, finished my career in Orlando, Florida. There, working with uh, you know a great bunch of people, and I've always enjoyed my career in the FBI and the people I met. And that's the end of the interview. Back at JerryWilliams.com, you'll find a photo of Eric Alpert, and you'll find links to newspaper articles about this case. Please share it with your friends, family, and associates. I make it easy for you at the bottom of the episode show notes. You'll see all the social media share buttons. And if you're listening to this by way of a podcast app, you can share it directly from your device. Don't forget to subscribe and review FBI Retired Case File Review on that podcast app. I would really appreciate it. Reviews help listeners find good podcast. I do have a crime fiction recommendation for you this week. It's the new John Grisham book, The Rooster Bar. It's about four law school students drowning in debt. Each one of them has managed to accumulate more than $90,000 in student loan debt. And the law school they attend? Well, students from there very, very seldom pass the bar and hardly ever get offers from the good, well-paying law firms. A tragedy occurs and they all quit law school in the last semester of their last year. And they devise a plot to get back at the financial institutions that encourage law students to take on so much student loan debt and financial burden. There's also a side plot involving illegal immigration and deportation. I think the book is thought-provoking and very timely, and I definitely recommend it. So my crime fiction recommendation is The Rooster Bar by John Grisham. And while you're at Amazon.com taking a look at The Rooster Bar, I hope you also 
pick up a copy of Pay to Play, my FBI crime thriller about corruption in the Philadelphia strip club industry, available as an ebook, trade paperback, and audiobook. This episode was sponsored by FBIRetired.com, the only online directory made available to the general public featuring retired FBI agents and analysts interested in showcasing their skills to secure business opportunities. I want to thank you for listening, and I hope you come back again for another episode of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. Thank you.